I'm going to be talking to Josipa Pertunic, who is the head of QTRIC, the Canadian Urban Transit Research and Investment Consortium, about whether Canada needs a federal strategy for electrified transit, rail, and coach. So welcome to the interview, Josipa. Thanks so much, Markham, for having me. Yeah, it's good to see you again. Um, I would say that this is a no-brainer, that of course we need a federal strategy. What's uh, your take on it? It is kind of a no-brainer, but then you have to ask yourself, why hasn't it happened for 10, 20, 50, 100 years, right? So obviously there must be some logic stopping it from happening. Um, the general idea here is if we want to electrify public transit, which we do, and we want to electrify coaches, which are interregional and intercity, and we want to electrify rail, which is interregional and intercity and national, there's really no way to get around it except for a national strategy because cities and provinces on their own are just not going to self-organize enough. And if you're talking about something like via rail going from coast to coast, or in the yesteryear of Greyhound and whatever is replacing it, like Red Arrow and several other providers, those coach systems just cannot cross provincial jurisdictions on hydrogen that doesn't exist or chargers that don't exist. And buses, coaches, and rail use very similar charging equipment for their high-powered and heavy-duty platforms, and they use the same kind of hydrogen pressure levels. So a national strategy is needed to electrify and decarbonize all of it to get the fueling and charging systems across all 10 provinces and three territories. Now, that makes perfect sense to me, but I have another question for you that's related to strategy. And that is, uh, over the last year and a half or so, I've become very interested in the way the many transportation technologies, the mobility technologies, the ones we have, the ones, the electric ones that are emerging, such as robo taxis and mm -hmm. and uh, electric scooters and all sorts of different ways. Now, e-bikes would be another good example, how it all works together. And I've often wondered if we don't need a strategy at the federal level with co provincial cooperation that integrates the three means of uh, transit that you talked about, along with these other technologies mm -hmm. to make us more efficient and get us around cities better and, and wherever we're going. Yeah, so I think the simple answer to it is yes, um, but the more complicated answer is, well, what does it look like? Well, this is what it looks like. So in addition to having a national strategy on how are we going to move rail and coach and bus across the provinces, given that they need this hydrogen, they need these chargers, there's the allied question of the big cities. And moving by bicycle, active transport, robo-taxi, it is an issue for cities. Like it's not a rural issue that it's not generally going to be the issue that solves the problem for rural or even semi-rural Canada. It's mostly the big cities, Toronto, Vancouver, Montreal, Calgary, Winnipeg, Edmonton, and throw in the GTHA communities like the Bramptons, the York regions, the Hamiltons. Um, it's their problem to solve to get people moving around. And so where the federal government and the national strategy come into play are certainly this groundbreaking idea we've been putting out there that the cities need to have a minister. And right now we have a minister at the federal level for municipalities. That's not good enough because our country is not equally divided and dispersed by population. The bulk of us live in Toronto, Montreal, and Vancouver, Calgary, and Edmonton. That's the bulk of Canada. So whether we like it or not, it's just the truth of it. And so moving the bulk of Canadians through those modes that you talked about, like an integrated transportation network, it's going to require some national goal setting First off, because our country is small, the population is small. And if we try to develop a strategy for Toronto and a different one for Vancouver and a different one for Montreal, we're just asking for needless complexity and wastage. The cities should lead what they need locally, but generally Canadian cities and Canadians who live in those cities need the same kind of mobility solutions that are efficient. And so having a minister for the big and mid-sized cities would help to solve that because you'd start to have a national strategy tied to some money, some incentives and some KPIs, like some serious performance measures that as a nation we set for the bulk of the population living in our urban communities. Um, so yes, short answer, yeah, we do need that strategy. More complicated answer, we'd actually need a new ministerial portfolio that privileges those cities and their transportation needs. That's not a hot topic for rural Canada. You know, there's gonna be backlash against that but it is necessary for moving Canadians. Now, uh, I'm very keen about the strategic approach 
uh, or uh, a strategic approach to using public capital. Uh, we've a lot of talk, in, especially since the U.S. Inflation Reduction Act back last August, uh, about industrial strategy, industrial policies to implement those strategies. And the modern approach to industrial policy seems to be much more collaborative. You know, you bring not only the federal government to the table, you bring city governments, provincial governments, stakeholders, industry, all, all sorts of folks, bring them together, working together, and then you take a strategic approach to these kinds of, of issues. And it's, it, do you see, and Qtrick seems to be a, just a logical big player in such a strategic approach for, for transit and, and city mobility. Do you see that kind of strategic approach emerging any place, uh, any, level, any level of government or elsewhere that would give General, us a little hope? Yeah. Um, so generally, the good news is there's a lot of cities in this country, the majority that have declared some kind of climate emergency and some hyperventilated panic around climate. And that's a good thing because it means most city councils, most mayors in the country now are completely dedicated to the idea of moving people faster, cleaner, greener, but they just don't have enough money on their own to do it. So they're looking to the parents of the Confederation, which is either the province or the federal government. Um, so that's the good news story. We're not kind of fighting the does climate change exist and do we need to improve our mobility story anymore at the municipal level? That, that fight has kind of been solved. The bigger fight is, can we get the provinces to align on how federal funds should be deployed? And that we have some work to do. And I'll give the example in healthcare. If you're watching the news right now, we know that there's been this healthcare dialogue and that the provinces need money for health. And the pushback has been, we don't want to be told how to use that money. Well, as Canadians, we all put money into the pot. And the idea here is not to put money into a pot that gets dispersed with no controls, right? Any good business, any good use of money is going to figure out where that money goes and whether it's beneficial. So the fact that recently there's some kind of healthcare deal we talk about where it's tied to some key performance measures of whether the system actually gets improved in terms of wait times and people served, that is a good movement forward. It's more massive than I think most of us realize. We need to do the same thing in transportation. So there is money at the federal level for public transit and zero emissions transit. This is very good. This program, its next iteration is going to be hopefully a permanent public transit fund from 2016 or 2026, sorry, onward. And that would be about $3 billion a year. Okay, it's a lot of money. It's a lot of money. To repeat, it's a lot of money. So we need to be making sure that it is tied to key performance measures that say, if this money goes to Toronto or Vancouver, Alberta, Saskatchewan, how is it being used? Is it moving more people? Is it actually getting more riders into transit? Is it reducing emissions? Right now, those KPIs don't exist. Good news, the federal government's doing a consultation to figure out what should those KPIs be. Bad news, it's against the culture of how money has been dispersed in the past. So you can expect provinces to say, don't tell us how to use this money. We're going to decide how to use it. And there's going to be a similar kind of healthcare dialogue that happens in about three years' time. So that's an okay story. Beyond that, like that strategic thinking at the federal level where you want to tie the money to some performance measures around ridership, emissions reduction, mobility, the next level then is the industrial policy you refer to. And here's where we're competing with the U.S. and we're always in this fight of like, how much money do we spend as taxpayers propping up our businesses here? And I would say the big challenge there is a lot of the dialogue has been around electric cars, electric cars and mining for the critical minerals that go into batteries. The mining story is building on something Canada does, where we have strength in this space, right? As, as um, you know, extractors of raw resources, we do have some value there where investments in that space might be valuable and we could see a long-term benefit. A TBD, but still. In the space where we use dollars for electric vehicle subsidies, which has been a big part of the discussion in the auto sector, there, I think we're heading for problems and we're already into problems. Can Canada's automotive sector, is not a headquarter base. We're just branch plants and we have been for a long time. So our factories get shut down and maintained based on decisions made in Detroit and decisions made in Europe, not decisions made in Ontario. And so because we're branch plants, the amount of tax dollars that has gone into trying to subsidize and prop up those industrial players, it's highly questionable as to whether it's actually created long-term jobs or retained jobs. If we continue on that pathway, it's not going to result in the long-term industrial growth that you're alluding to in this new industry. 
Yeah, and I think it should be pointed out that uh, on the transit side, Canada does have a number of bus manufacturers. We've got Lion Electric in Quebec. We've got Flyer Industries in Manitoba. We've got Green Power in in Vancouver, and I'm sure I've missed a couple. And so if I understand where you're going with this argument, if we're taking a strategic approach and we want to create industrial clusters, we want to create good paying technical jobs, those sorts of things, we should be looking to the transit in- issue uh, industry, the, the medium and heavy duty truck industry, where we have players already in the industry that are domestic. And that should be a focus. And it hasn't been to date. Exactly so. And so you stated it better than I did. Um, We do have these manufacturers, definitely New Flyer in Winnipeg and Manitoba, a Canadian-based company. They do manufacture in the U.S. and the bulk of it's in the U.S., but their headquarters, their R&D decisions are in Manitoba, and that's still the headquarters. So that is a serious growth opportunity. Then you have these others, uh, Volvo Group, that has this large factory and manufacturing plant as the Nova bus brand in Quebec. Um, Then you have Lion Electric in Quebec. So quite a few players. Are they at the scale of the auto sector? No, not yet, but are they getting there? Very soon, if you add in rail. And the fact of the matter is, if we read the writing on the wall, public transit, coaches, rail are going to be the mode of mobility through the 21st century into the 22nd. So investing in that growth, those manufacturing plants, those R&D jobs, that's going to create an immediate local return on investment that is beyond the decision making that is outsourced to the outside world. Now, people might say, yeah, but you know what, Volvo is actually a European company that's owned by actually Gilly, which is a Chinese company. So the R&D decisions are not happening in Quebec. That's not entirely true. Um, Volvo does make a lot of the R&D decisions in Europe, but the manufacturing plant and the R&D footprint in Quebec is substantial. So they're operating within a globalized world. We have to really consider, are these plants making R&D decisions? And the answer to that in rail and bus is yes. So similarly, the Bombardier plants um, from Kingston to Montreal that were bought out by Alstom, they are still making research and development decisions. Those are high quality engineering jobs. They're not just metal benders. And so building on that, where you actually have R&D decision making happening in Canada, that's probably going to be greater bang for our buck than investing in branch plant expansions. So to wrap up our conversation, uh, Jospa, uh, give us a, a, a peek into the window over between you know the next five years uh, on it's kind of the pro- the strategic process or the process of strategic consultation and developing a strategy that we just talked about. What does that look like? Well, I'd say there's two elements that it needs to look like and it's kind of starting to look like. The first is at the federal level around hydrogen. Um, So there is Natural Resources Canada has its hydrogen strategy. And then you have Infrastructure Canada that has money for hydrogen buses if people want to figure out a way to buy them. And then you have the Canada Infrastructure Bank that will finance it if you can figure out a way to save money off this stuff. Nobody's really figured that out yet because the supply chain isn't developed, but it's there. So you have at least three branches of government, two ministries and an agency, all sitting to the same tune. What it needs to look like now going forward is that integrated Natural Resources Canada, Transport Canada, Infrastructure Canada, and the Canada Infrastructure Bank financing system, those three corners of the federal government getting together, holding hands, getting married, and having a national hydrogen strategy for bus, coach, rail, and heavy-duty truck. That would be a winning strategic solution. There's inklings that that is already starting to happen. So that's good news. The second big element around strategic thinking is that permanent transit fund. So that permanent infrastructure funding that has been proposed for the first time ever in Canadian history of three billion per year for transit, that sounds like just a do-good or kind of socialist, let's help transit idea. It's actually way more fundamental. It's starting the pathway to strategically say as Canadians, we have a right to mobility. That's a game changer. If I have a constitutional right to mobility, which I don't yet, But this funding kind of suggests that we're going that route, that the federal government believes everybody in Canada needs to have good access to good public transit, just like we do have good access to healthcare and education. We're starting to go that way philosophically. Once that gets going with a permanent fund, it starts to look like a permanent right to mobility. That strategically changed the dialogue entirely. It means that governments can't back down in the future or will be less able to back down from defunding public transit. When you do that, it's not so much about the jobs that we make in manufacturing. It's about the money we make through income taxes because people can live their life. They can get from point A to point B because they actually always have 
of low cost, efficient, sustainable transit, which they don't in Canada today. It's a game changer for women. It's a game changer for single parents. It's a game changer for those on a lower economic scale. And it's a game changer for the cities that need middle class and upper middle class people to leave their cars behind and move only by public transit. So those two strategic things are starting to happen. I actually don't know if the federal government realizes like what they've unleashed, the Pandora's box they've opened, but it is for the good of Canadians that, that these two elements are occurring. Well, Yospa, as always, uh, a pleasure to, to chat and we'll be following up to see whether or not the, the federal government follows through on uh, its strategic approach to transit. Thanks so much, Michael.